So um, as I say, you're all very welcome to this uh, very first um, webinar in our autumn series, um, co-hosted by Thrive, the Wellbeing Hub. Um, hopefully you do know about Thrive. Thrive is um, a dedicated space for our members and our students to um, to access supports really as they go through their journey with the Institute. Um, there's an awful lot there on, on the hub, um, but we also have some core services around um, you know, professional uh, counselling if you need it, um, wellness coaching and lots and lots of articles and webinars such as this. So it's all there on that on that hub. So you can check that out at your leisure. Um, my name is Dee France and I'm the manager of Hub and I also look after our in-house charity, which is a benevolent fund, um, another word for a benevolent fund, CA support. Um, and that is, uh, again, on the theme of financial wellness and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, we provide financial emergency financial assistance to our members and our students um, if they are you know, blindsided by something that's happening to them in their life. So um, it's a donation based model. And um, we are, as I say, a charity and we have a board of directors. Um, and that's a very active space, um, particularly at the moment with the cost of living crisis. So I'd really implore anyone that's in a good space financially that you might consider us um, for um, you know, a charitable donation. But you can also check that out on our website as well. So as I say, you're very welcome. And um, thanks for joining us today. We're going to try and crack into this and, and have um, a bit of time left for lunch at the end. Uh, so today we're delighted to welcome Carol Glynn, our speaker, who has two decades of experience working as a chartered accountant in audit and industry. And she now runs her own very successful financial coaching business. So Carol helps her clients to gain clarity and control over their finances through practical financial literacy education, mindset coaching and mentoring. So I think we can all safely say that we could be doing with a bit of that at the moment. So uh, before we hand over to Carol, I'm delighted to say that um, this webinar is jointly hosted by Thrive and the Young Professionals. And today we're joined by uh, Clara Doyle, who is a member of the Young Professionals Committee. And I'm going to hand over to Clara, uh, to Clara to just run through a few of the great activities that they're involved in and to see if something might pique your interest. So you're very welcome, Clara. Thanks, Dee. So as Dee said, my name is Clara Doyle and I work as an international tax manager at PTC Therapeutics and I am the PRO for the Young Professionals Committee. So this has been my second term on the committee and I suppose I joined the Young Professionals post-COVID really to build up my network and connect with like-minded individuals. I suppose I'd moved from working in practice into an industry setting and I'd also made the move from my home in the Morrison County Diet up to Dublin so that was a big change of scenery to say the least. So really the objective of the Young Professionals Committee is to support the needs of our members from ACA right through to SCA I suppose there's a real tendency, you know, when you pass your exams, you get qualified to just drop off, not go to events, not work opportunities. And I'd hold my hands up. I was that person. It was really only, um, you know, when I moved up to Dublin after COVID and all it hit that I said, I really want to build up my network. And I thought, what better way to re-engage with the Institute than to join the Young Professionals Committee? So the committee, just like many of our other societies, um, make these connections and is easy and as straightforward for all of you. We hold an active schedule of events, just like the one today, with thanks to the Thrive. And on Friday, we also have a quiz night with Sadie of Young Solicitors. So you're more than welcome to join us at that. So if you're interested in learning more about us or any of the societies, feel, feel free to drop us an email. I'll pop it in the chat with a sign up link for our next event. So moving closer so to, to the topic of today's discussion around financial wellness, um, many of you will have heard the well-known expressions, money doesn't grow on tree, trees, or I suppose the one I hear so often is, did we win the lotto? Um, chances are you'll have said that as a child, as an adult, and you might have even said it on down through your own kids or your nieces and nephews. And I suppose our wants and our needs are really change across our lifetime. Like many of you, I've experienced the annual rent rikes, the landlord selling the house, finding new accommodation and really the stress and uncertainties around that. Um, and more recently, so as I've started looking at purchasing a new house, a house. So anyone that's gone through that process um, will really remember the level of scrutiny that goes into your finances and your spending. And I suppose for me, I relied on colleagues, friends and parents, you know, for advice. And I remember people always saying to me, I wish there was only a checklist or a cheat sheet for this. 
So it's at, it's at this point, I'm going to introduce you to my fellow chartered accountant, um, Carl Glynn. As Dee mentioned, Carl has a wealth of experience in audit and industry. He's worked in regional head of finance roles and is a financial wellness coach and mentor. She focuses on empowering her clients to take control of their money through practical financial literacy, mindset coaching and mentoring. And I'm delighted to say that Carol is going to introduce us to her financial wellness checklist, which we're going to pop it in the chat as well for you all and really ta talk us through an easy to manage approach towards your finances. So thanks so much for that. And um, so I'm going to hand you over now to Carol. Hi, well, thank you very much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here being a, a chartered accountant myself. It is a real honor to, to be asked to present this on a topic that clearly is very close to my heart, something I'm very, very passionate about and is as important now as it ever has been, you know, with everything that we're facing with economies and increasing inflation and who knows what's going to happen next. So it is always a good time to look at our finances, but now is as good a time as ever. I would talk about this for hours. I have so much information I'd love to share. We have 30 minutes. I do want to respect everyone's time. So I will jump straight in to what we're going to cover today. How to gain clarity over your current financial situation. The vast majority of my clients will come to me and say, I just don't know what's happening with my money. Usually it's a case of I don't have a crazy lifestyle. I tend to be quite good with it. I think I'm good with money. And this is all walks of life education. We're all accountants here. I have experienced accountants of all trades and backgrounds who will tell me this as well. But it just seems to fall through my fingers. I don't know why I'm not saving as much as I think I should. And our financial lives are loaded with that word should, which we'll get to as well. So I'm going to talk to you about how to gain that clarity, how to understand really what's happening with your money, how to understand your spending habits and create a positive budget that works for you. Now, I don't like the word budget, despite being an accountant. It's a very corporate word. It is has a different meaning when it comes to our personal lives. You'll find I use the word cash or the phrase cash flow plan much more. It's effectively a budget, but a budget feels like I've done something wrong, that I've been put on a budget, that it's like a diet for my money and it's shameful generally. But we can use budgets in a very positive way and we'll talk about what that looks like. How to understand the importance of incorporating your values and goals in money management. And this comes back to a point that Claire made. You know, it comes back to our value system, our mindset. Our mindset is key when it comes to money management. We are trained in school, if we're lucky, but also, you know, as accountants, you know, we know how to run a PL, we know how to create a cash flow plan, we know how to read the numbers. But money management is so much more than that when it comes to our personal lives, our own money. It's about our value system, giving it a purpose, having goals, and your money mindset really feeds into that. So we'll talk about how to incorporate that to understand it and the difference that will make to not only how you manage your money, but your stress levels. How do we get out of a paycheck to paycheck cycle or feeling financially reactive? being taken um, by surprise by large amounts, re relying on credit cards when we don't want to. So I'll give you some tips and tricks how to first present, uh, prevent that. And then also if you do find yourself in that paycheck to paycheck cycle, how you can get out of it. And all of this, but my goal is to help you gain momentum towards your personal values driven financial goals. So before I get into the detail of it, I was asked to just give a quick background. I know um, Dee and Claire did talk a little bit about who I am. Thank you so much for that. And I really need to update this picture of my children because they're, they're not that young anymore. But I do have very few pictures of them sitting together and all looking at the camera. Um, so it's a precious one. But I am... Irish. Um, I trained in PwC in Ireland. Then I moved to Abu Dhabi coming on almost 14 years ago. I moved to Ernst & Young in Abu Dhabi and then I moved into industry. And I had a really, honestly, in hindsight, and at the time, I'm not sure I appreciated it or um, realized how lucky I was, a phenomenal career. Um, when you look at it from all perspectives, as a woman, as an accountant, um, as a mother, as someone in the Middle East, as an expat, 
I really had amazing roles. I, you know, my the largest remit, I have 150 people working for me when I worked for AIG Insurance across all of EMEA. I've set up accounting centers in India. We've restructured multiple things. Then I moved into um, a consulting and armed protection business, which was amazingly interesting, surrounded by phenomenal people. Um, had a great work-life balance in that role, which is can be sometimes difficult to find in those really senior, high responsibility finance positions. Um, they do exist. They absolutely do exist. And it was a phenomenal company to work for. But long story short, I realized that I had manifested the best job I could possibly imagine for myself. It ticked all of the boxes that I wanted in my career. And I realized it still wasn't doing it for me. And that's when I sat down and went, okay, it's not the company. It's not the job. It's not the remit. You know, the money, I was really well paid. I was living in, in Dubai at this point. Um, and yet I wasn't happy. So that's when I took some time out and I looked at what I want to do next. And this is where Conscious Finance Coaching was born. Um, I realized that I, as an accountant who actually trained in investment management department, so most of my career was dealing with money um, as an accountant, didn't feel financially confident for a long time. Felt overwhelmed when I thought about how to invest, how to budget, what to do with my money. I was always good when it came to debt, but too much. I had a very lack mindset. And I realized that if I, with all the skill set that I had and the interest I had in reading books and doing all of the work, and I love a good spreadsheet, I love maths, yet I felt that I wasn't fully equipped. I felt like an imposter. I was thinking, imagine what other people must be feeling like when they have no exposure to all of that the skills that I had. So I did some research um, and I talked to friends and colleagues and did some surveys and I realized a large population of people feel the same way. So that's why I thought, you know what, this is where I can help people. I've been through that process. Um, I did courses and I created my business. And like I think it was Claire said, my goal is to help my money, put help my clients put their money behind their values by consciously using your income to live your life that you want, the life that aligns most with your dreams, your goals. And doing that both from a pr practical perspective, giving you the tools to know how to do that, to be able to do that combined with the mindset piece, which is really crucial. So on that, I just want to do a quick survey. You can either go to menti.com and use that code. If you have your phone handy, you can scan this barcode and it will pop up this quiz. I would love to just kind of see what your confidence levels are when it comes to budgeting your own money, getting out of debt, planning for retirement, how to achieve financial freedom. And that can mean many things to different people. And then do you really understand or do you feel confident about investing and why that's important? And if you think about it, these results are probably not that surprising. You know, we are trained to budget and there's a lot of support out there about how to budget. There's a lot of information about how to get out of debt, how to manage debt. But the kind of softer side of it is the investing. Very often that's more emotional. How to achieve financial freedom. What does that actually mean? And that's where we, we start to procrastinate. And then planning for our retirement. And this can very much depend on where you are in your career. You know, when we are just starting out and we're maybe in our 20s, just earning for the first time, it feels so far away. But then time passes and suddenly we realize, actually, this is more complicated than I expected. I'm not sure what to do. So I'll focus on these areas most. It's really interesting results. We all know how to budget, which is really, really important. Or cash flow plan, as I will say. So just very quickly, what is money? You know, we put a lot of weight on money. You know, how many decisions do you make on a daily basis that are not impacted by money? If you actually sit with that and think about it, it's very, very few. You know, even when we do things that are, you know, on the face of it free, there's still money involved. You know, if I want to go and visit a friend and spend a few hours with them at their home, it's still I need to have maybe a car to drive there, fuel for that car, the clothing that I wear to get there. Do I bring a gift? Are we going to eat while we're there? Will I order something? 
there is always aspects of money involved in it, even when it's perceivably free, to can I afford this? Is this the right house for me? Is this investment what I should be investing in? How much should I be paying off my debt? I'm going to buy my lunch. Will I will I buy it or will I bring it from home? We're constantly weighing up. And sometimes that's conscious and sometimes it's it's really not conscious at all, but it's just there at the back of your mind. If you do, especially if you're sitting in a scarcity mindset and you're fearful around money, that will feed into your decisions. And it can be very heavy and weigh us down. And there's a lot of emotion attached to money. You know, it can cause a lot of arguments in families. It's the number one cause of arguments in relationships, which then leads on to being the number one cause of divorce. It also is the number one cause of stress worldwide in men and women worrying about money. We put a lot of weight on it and we don't talk about it enough. You know, we'll talk about our eating habits and our food and our exercise habit and our sleeping habits, which are all extremely important, but and it's equally important as how do we feel about money? What are we doing with our money? To me, money is energy. Yes, it has a substance, but so does food. But food is just energy for our bodies. When we have a healthy relationship with it and we're very conscious and intentional with it, we tend to do better with how we eat. Money is exactly the same. It's an energy we need to do almost everything in our lives. And what it provides for us really is choice. And you can talk about, oh, yeah, that's fine if you have money. But the more money we have, the more choices we have. Absolutely. The higher we earn, the more choices that are available to us. And that's why having more money is a good thing. We can often say, you know, Claire mentioned these, these they're essentially limiting beliefs that we hear all the time. Do you think money is born? Money is um, grown on trees. Do you think I'm made of money is what I would have heard a lot growing up. Do you think we are made of money? But the more money we have, the more choices we have. And that's really when freedom starts coming in. And what it does is money provides security. I can pay my rent or my mortgage. I can have a home for me and my family. I can pay my electricity bill. I can have heating. I feel secure that I can provide the basics for myself and my family when I feel financially secure. You build on from that with freedom. I have the freedom to do what I want to do. I have the freedom to live in the house that I want to live in rather than the house that I have to live in because that's all I can afford. There is nothing wrong with wanting more money to do better, to be able to make those choices. And again, that's where your, your value system comes in. And then the power to live your life the way you want to live it. And power can be a loaded one. It's never for me power over other people, being better than other people. It's just power to make the choices, to have the security and to feel free in what I do on a daily basis. And this is all wrapped kind of around the key elements of financial wellness. The financial wellness checklist, we will put um, either in the chat at the end or you'll get an email afterwards. But if you want it now, you can use this QR code again and download it. The checklist is 13 areas that I think are really crucial to financial wellness. And it's a bit fun, I hope. Um, it is where you can answer yes or no to each question that's there on each element of financial wellness. And it gives you a score at the end. And what it really is, is just to trigger you to think about areas that maybe you can work on to improve when it comes to your money. Um, or And it can be, you know, a to-do list almost. A, a lot of people will say to me, I don't know where to start. I know I need to do better with my money. I want to but I don't know where to start. And this is where the shoulds come in. You know, we ask our friends and family often for advice and you will hear all sorts. You should save this amount of money. You should get out of debt. No, you should use debt. Maybe it's a time of, well, not right now, but a few years ago, low interest rates, it's cheap debt, utilize that. Someone else would say, absolutely not, never have debt. Put your money here, invest that, buy a house, no, go on the stock market all of these things. And then it just drives procrastination because when we're not bringing it back to ourselves and our value system, we end up just getting confused and not knowing what to do. And money, again, such an emotional topic. It is our sense of safety, especially for women. Um, we tend to see money as that sense of safety and we're much more reluctant to part with it unless we're absolutely sure when it comes to like savings and investment. So what are the key elements I'm going to touch on today for financial wellness? There are 13, but I've condensed it here because I just want to make sure I get the main ones in the, in the time that we have. 
Values and goals I've mentioned a few times. Start there. Sometimes people will say to me, like, what's that got to do with it? Money is practical. Money is being wise. Money is being smart. Money is spending less, saving more, investing. It's so much more than that. Value system is where we look at what's actually important to me. What am I trying to achieve with my life? Do I want to retire early? Do I want to buy the big house? Or am I actually, you know, I'm happy to have a small apartment so that I have money for other things because having the big house is not important to me. It's not on my value system. Do I want to be able to travel? Is travel important to me? Is it a core value for me? Is connection really important to me? How do I connect with people and do I need money to do that? This is where we link our value system with our money, where Am I using my money in line with my values? And that's where the should start falling away. The keeping up with the Joneses isn't such a problem. Because when someone says to you, oh, you've just got a new job, you've got a promotion or you've got a bonus. Why don't you upgrade your car? When you're quite happy with your car, this has happened to me before. I've had the conversation where, you know, I like cars, um, but I had a really lovely car. It was getting old, but it worked perfect. It was well kept. Great for me. As I got promoted in my corporate career, I was constantly told my car does not align with where I stand in career wise, that I should use some of my money to upgrade that car. Now, that was not important to me. I mean, people never saw my car. It also was confusing to me. But if I wasn't sure that having a really fancy, nice car was not in line with my values, then I could have spent money on that thinking that's what I should do. Instead, I was able to stand there and go, I get where you're coming from. I see other people doing that. That's okay for them. Maybe having a nice car is really important to them. They really enjoy it and they're happy to use their money in that way. For me, it's not for me. I would rather use my money to travel more every year, to buy other things that are important to me that you might tell me is a waste of money, but I'm using it in line with my values. So I make those decisions much more comfortably um, I'm not worried about just keeping up with the Joneses or being told what I should do with my money. There's a, the risk of lifestyle creep is less unless it's one that you genuinely makes you feel happier. Then it really just helps us bring it back to what do I want and what am I going to do with my money to make sure I get that. And that's why values will feed into all of this. Goals then building on from that, we're always told, you know, have the big goals. Look, it, it came up in the little survey that we did. You know, I don't know how to do financial freedom, which we will be told, you know, that is a great financial goal to have. Achieve financial freedom, invest for your future, plan for your retirement, maybe pay off your mortgage. They're all really great goals to have, but we need to bring it back to why, because they are tend to be big goals. You know, if I want to retire early, we tend to need extra money, a lot of money to do that because you might lose 10 years of, if you retire at 55, um, 65, whatever it might be, but you're losing income earning power by retiring early. So you need to save extra for that. Do you actually really want to do that? Why is that important for you? If you're not excited by that goal, if you don't know, if you can't visualize what you're going to do at, let's say 55 when you're retired, what are you going to do? Why is that important? Why is that exciting to you? Have you mapped that out? Then that's just money in the bank that means nothing to you. It's not going to bring you a sense of security or freedom. It's not going to make you feel like you are powerful with your money and what you're trying to achieve because that's someone else's goal. It's not yours. Financial freedom tends to be a big one that people talk about. And it's a case of rather than early retirement, where it's I am financially free to work because I want to, not because I have to. So I might work until I'm 80, but I can stop working at a certain age. That's a different goal. And that tends to excite people because they say, well, that just makes me feel I'll have security, I'll have freedom, I'll have choices and I'll have power over what I'm doing in my life. That's much more exciting goal to work towards than just retire early and have money. It just falls flat. So using your goals in that way is really important. Understanding your why, giving them a purpose. Is it true to you? Do you really want to do that? Do you really want to pay the mortgage off? Is that what you want to do with your money? Or are you doing it just because you feel you should? When you do that, then your goals become easier to achieve. They are more exciting when you need to say no to things, when inflation is rising and you can't go out with your friends as much. You can't go on that holiday that you go on every year because 
cost of living has gone up, your groceries have gone up beyond your control, you're not saving as much if you go on with that holiday, then you can sit there and go, what's more important to me? The financial freedom at that age or my annual holiday? What's more important to me? Then you can make that values-based, goal-oriented choice in that situation. The next step then when it comes to financial wellness is now that you've got more of an idea of what's important to you, how you're going to use your money to achieve it, then and what your goals are, financial clarity. And this is where people tend to fall down. Um, maybe not in this room, because you know we tend to have the tools and the ability to look at where our money is going, but really opening up that bonnet of how am I spending my money every month? How much am I spending on, on shopping and groceries, on rent or my mortgage, on eating out, on travel, um, travel to work, on taxis, on drinks? Categorize it all and really look at it for the last six months. That's where you learn where your money is going, why it's falling through your hands. We do so much subconscious spending that we're just not even registering. And that's where the hemorrhaging happens. I'm not here to say, oh, we can't buy Starbucks. I don't like that old cliche of just stop spending. What we need to do is spend with intention. Look at where you're spending your money and not an estimates, not it's in your head. We're very good at spreadsheets probably, but we cannot run spreadsheets in our brains. We need to track it and see, audit it basically, but audit it with the mindset of just pure knowledge. No should haves, could haves, would haves, just looking at it to go, ah, what am I learning here about my lifestyle? Because your money will reflect your lifestyle. Where are you spending it? What am I learning here about where I'm spending money that's actually not in line with my values? That's very much easier to change than just say cut costs on something that you're enjoying. Get the low hanging fruit. Where am I actually spending money that's not adding to my life? That it's subconscious. Are there things like old subscriptions, old memberships? things that I'm just spending money on that I had forgotten about. And even if it's 20 euros a month, you know, that's still money that can go towards something that's better. You could buy two books with that, maybe that you actually would enjoy. You can put that towards, you know, your lunch out that you'd rather have than just money going to a subscription that you don't use. It's being really intentional with it and getting that financial clarity, really looking at how you're spending your money on an app, in a spreadsheet, in detail will give you that. When you then have that knowledge, you can look at planning your budget or what I prefer to call my cash flow plan. Money needs to flow. If we hoard it, it, it just creates actually it, more stress unless that is saving for a purpose. So if you are saving a lot of money for a deposit um, and you're being really intentional to spend as little as possible while you're gathering your deposit because that house is important to you, that's different to just saving, 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 must save, must save, which is where I sat probably 15 years ago. Must save, must save. This all might go away. Must save as much as possible. But it was never enough because I had no purpose. It was just money in the bank. It was almost intangible. Amazing to have it. But actually, it made me sometimes I felt ungrateful. It's like, I had saved a lot of money here. Why do I not feel better? Why do I feel like I need more? I felt greedy, even though I wasn't actually being greedy. What it was, was it didn't have a purpose. So it was intangible to me. When I now save, each thing has a purpose. I'm saving for my annual holiday home to Ireland. I'm saving for a deposit for a house. I'm saving for, and it's in line with my goals. And then it starts feeling like actually you're achieving something. So you need to map that into your budget for the next 12 months based on everything you've learned, your values, your goals, your clarity on what's happening with your money right now. Where am I happy? I'm going to keep doing that. Where am I not happy? I'm going to cut that out. What does that leave me with? Am I saving what I want to save? I often get asked, how should I budget? Um, what should I spend on things? My favorite is the 50-20-30 approach to budgeting. And that is up to 50% on your um, needs. So your housing, your electricity, your mobile phone, things like your groceries, your food, things that you need to survive, up to 30% on your wants or the fun stuff, eating out, maybe health and fitness classes, travel, shopping, takeaways, things like that, things that we just like to do, enjoy to do, make our lives a bit more fun and easier and all the rest, up to 30% on that. And ideally, at least 20% of your income on your what I call your future self, traditionally savings, but I say your future self, something that my future self is going to benefit from, but it's very intentional. Again, it has that purpose. This is where also you can plan for your to prevent your paycheck to paycheck cycle. 
At the minute, if you are feeling the crunch with rising prices across many different categories of our budgets, if you think about it, um, being doing this can really help ease your stress because it gives you back a sense of control. So you can look at, at your cash flow plan and say, OK, where can I reduce that you know is not going to really reduce my life necessarily if we can do that or where am I happy to sacrifice until I get back on my feet from a paycheck to paycheck cycle it gives you that foresight to see it it gives you that information to make those intentional and because you can see the bottom line you're no longer in the red maybe it gives you that motivation that actually it's doable it gives you that kind of intention that plan a sunk fund then is where you plan for known expenses this will be the biggest thing for getting out of paycheck to paycheck cycle and preventing it so if you pay for an easy example if you pay your car insurance every year in one lump sum because it's cheaper than doing direct debit rather than relying on your income that month to pay that full amount a year once you pay it then you know you're going to pay it again in 12 months let's say it's 2400 euros divide that by 12 so every month in a separate savings account um and I, I don't recommend certain things, but I know Revolut, I believe, is great for this. You can have vaults, create a vault, for example, in Revolut um, and put 200 every month of your income into that. So that when your car insurance is due next year, you're not draining your income that month with that 2,400. You're taking it from your sunk fund. Your income that month is basically untouched. So other than the 200. So you don't have these spikes in your expenses. Do that for as many of your semi-annual or irregular costs that you're aware of. Save up in advance your annual holiday, something like that. It will really help reduce your stress. It will give you back that sense of achievement and it will buffer you for shocks as well. The other one here, the next point is on savings. Number one is emergency fund, or as I prefer to call a cash cushion. I talk about shoulds when it comes to money. There's so many shoulds. You should spend this. You shouldn't spend that. You should invest in crypto. No, buy houses. No, go stocks. Oh, you could be dead tomorrow. You know, spend it all. You know, we're constantly bombarded with this. They're all just ideas. Some of them with more merit than others. My number one, and only should, is a cash cushion or an emergency fund. Have at least three months, to maybe six months, of your living expenses that you've realized what they are the true amount in your clarity sheet your average monthly living expense in an easy accessible ideally high interest earning um if you can get one um bank account that will give you financial security that will give you that sense of oh my grocery bill has gone up where am i going to get the money my car is broken down i didn't expect this um the, the water heater has has gone. I didn't expect this to happen. It was new. I don't know. Whatever. I've got money to deal with it. I can figure it out. I don't need to go on the credit card. I don't need to get a loan. It protects us against the inevitable. It can recession proof you for a certain period of time, depending on how much you have there. Um, and it gives you choices. It's back to choices as well. If you're in a case where, you know, maybe during COVID, for example, a lot of people lost their jobs or had reduced income, for example, you have a cash cushion. And the reason I use that is like it's not just for negative things as well. You know, you're bouncing back off it. But in this case, if something negative does happen, it gives you choices in the sense that you don't have to rush straight into the first job that you get. Let's say if you're made redundant for whatever reason, you can go, I've got a period of time here where I can figure this out and find the next best right job for me than um, just getting the first job that I possibly can, which has happened with a few of my clients where they've said this, their money situation hasn't changed. They've just separated their savings into these buckets, giving them all a purpose, and it's made them feel so much freer to swap jobs when they need to, which is what I did. I had my savings. It gave me that freedom to set up my own business because I wasn't dependent on the income for a period of time. Um, and it gives them, you know, that choice to make those decisions about their life. They're the key points in the half an hour that I have that I really wanted to go through to really set you up for that sense of financial wellness. You know, the, the survey showed people know how to manage debt and get out of debt. Investing for your future is the best thing you can do for your future self. It really is. Other than getting out of bad debt, investing for your future. 
really focusing on that and um, utilizing any tax um tax beneficial ways to do that that you will have in Ireland I'm in the UAE it's not a consideration for me and um, we have a lot of other considerations but tax is not something that I need to worry about here when it comes to investing right now but really putting your money to work we work hard for our money we want to have it working for us and then giving your investments a purpose is what I would say what is it for rather than just putting it into an investment fund and it's again just money happening in the background that is great in theory, but what's it adding to my life? Knowing your net worth is really important. Um, listing out all of your assets, taking away all of your, your liabilities, so any current account savings you have, a mortgage, credit card, personal loan, anything that you have minus from that, that is your true measurement of wealth. It's not your income. Our incomes can go away. They can shrink. They can grow. Taxes can change. Our net worth is our true measurement of wealth. It's what we have done with our money. It's what we can fall back on if something happens. And it's a really motivating way to look at what am I doing with my money when you see that net worth growing. And all of this underpinned by mindset. Mindset is the key to really doing well with your money. Like It's actually not about how much you earn, although the more we earn, the more choice we have, the more we can do with it. But unless you've learned how to manage your money when it's a smaller amount, then those mistakes will just be amplified. Those senses of insecurity, that sense of lack will just be amplified with the more money that we earn. The pressure will be more. The stress can often be more. So understanding your mindset when it comes to money. Do you say to yourself, you know, I'm useless with money. I don't know what to do. Um, it's too complicated. Money doesn't grow on trees. This might all go away. I need to save, save, save because it might go away. Be really conscious of all of that, especially if you're doing this exercise for the first time. Just be aware of what's coming up for you, especially in the financial clarity exercise. What language are you saying to yourself in your head? Why did you spend that money? That was a waste of money. You're so stupid when you did that. This kind of things will really show you that that negative self-talk will hold you back. We need to move that into a more positive or an abundance mindset. I know abundance is a word that's thrown out there a lot right now, but it's that feeling of I can do this, that positive growth mindset. I can do this. I can manage my money well. My values are good core values. When I'm using my money in line with that, I'm doing well with my money. Um, Because very few of us have, you know, a core value would be to get myself into debt. You know, we, we do align with good ones generally. Um, so being very mindful of that mindset throughout this exercise can tell you a lot about how you feel about money, how you've been behaving with money, because that will feed into how you behave with money. If you have a lack mindset, you might spend less or you might spend it all. If you think, oh, it's going to go anyway. What's the point? Um, if you have an abundance mindset, it gives you that sense of there's more coming. I can manage this. It's OK. What you really want to do is get to what we call the millionaire mindset. And that is where, and we're in a great position for this, because for a lot of us as accountants, we have the skill set to do, to do the budgeting, do the forecasting, understand what the numbers are saying to us. You combine that with the positive mindset of, I am actually good with money. Money is a good thing. I can help people. The more money I have, the more I can help people, the more I can support my family. It's not greedy to want more money. It doesn't make me a bad person. Money is not the root of all evil. It's an energy that will help us achieve what we want to achieve when we use it with that mindset. It is that old adage of money is an amazing servant, but a terrible master, or maybe the other way around, but it's a terrible master. If we let money rule us and we sit in that mindset of it's bad, I don't, I shouldn't want more, it's greedy, there isn't enough to go around, then it causes distress and it shrinks us. When we look at it going, I'm taking control of my money, I'm using it for good, I'm using it for how I think is the right way to use it, based on all of this knowledge that I have and the skill set that I have and the people I have around me, then it becomes less stressful, more exciting, empowering, motivating, and we tend to do more with it. And everyone benefits, our families, ourselves, our communities, economies, when we approach it in that way. I talked about this already with the sunk fund, so I'll just do two seconds on it. But it's back to, again, the sunk funds and the emergency fund or that cash flow, um, sorry, that, that uh, cash cushion, because we can't control when life happens but we can control how we feel it financially. I mean, I'll give an example from me. I live in, in Dubai. I am an expat. Unfortunately, we do get phone calls, you know, 
something happens, someone happens to some something happens to someone at home, and I need to fly home for that. That's an expensive last minute cost. When I have my cash cushion there, I can just that's one of the reasons for me. That's one of its purposes. If I need to get home, I never have to worry about how am I going to pay for that flight. The money is there because that's important to me to be able to get home when I need to get home. It's a core value for me. So then I can use that money. I can go home. I can't control when life happens, but I can control how I feel it financially. I don't want to be worrying about what has happened compounded by financial worry on top of it. And then when I come back and everything is settled, I can then start replenishing my cash cushion with the amount that I spent. I'm not paying off a credit card debt. You know, I'm not having, I'm, have, I was able to go without looking for support from other people. All of those things are very important to me. And that is true, this process. Having that plan in place, having your sunk funds, having the emergency fund, protect yourself, um, and then you will and can do more with your money. So I ran a little bit over time. I'm sorry, I think I'm about five minutes over, but I just want to do one little thing here, another um, Mentimeter, where if you scan this or if you still have it open, it should now pop up that... Just one thing that you can do to improve your financial wellness, you know, to if you're feeling very stressed, what can you do to help reduce that stress? Is it look at your mindset and see how that's feeding it? Is it actually be brave and analyze your spending? Do you have a cash flow plan or a budget in place that means something to you that's aligned with what you want to achieve, not what someone else told you? Anything else from what we talked about today? And then I am here for as long as you will have me to answer any questions that you have. Analyze spending. Yes, I love that. In line with your values, it makes it so much more exciting, so much more interesting, and you will always do more with it. But even on that, I would say, be gentle with yourself because it can be a process. A lot of our money habits, our financial habits are there since childhood. They're things that are subconsciously ingrained in us. Um, and sometimes we have commitments as well that we need to work on undoing. So it can be a process to get to maybe the 50, 20, 30 that we mentioned. So again, going with it with that sense of this is a process. It's like anything. You don't go to the gym the first day and suddenly come out with a six pack. We figure out what we want to do, how it's going to work, and then we work on it. The mindset and separate savings, yeah. Exactly, I love that. Breathe and remember that as long as you are alive, there is an answer to these problems that we don't know yet. That is an amazing growth mindset. We don't know yet, but we can find it. Saving consistently, that's a great one. And on that, actually, I didn't mention when it comes, comes to saving, doing that clarity exercise. Very often, um, people will tell me, you know, I earn well, I'm good with money. I put, a, I put an amount away every month whatever that might be, let's say it's 50 euros or 500 euros, whatever that might be for you. And I think that that's a reasonable amount given what I earn and my lifestyle. But halfway through the month, I end up dipping into it because I, I don't understand why. The clarity piece will really help with that because what you can do when you do your cash flow plan, when you've mapped out all of your responsibilities for the next 12, 12 months, you can actually see what you can consistently save. So it might not be the 500 you thought, maybe it's 200. And that's okay, because what you want to do is consistently, as soon as you get paid, put that aside and then work on building it up to 500. Now you have the clarity and the plan in place. And then at the end of the month, if there's any extra left over, you can move it across. And that's much more motivating and satisfying than putting it in and taking it back. Um, Hi, it's Claire. Hi, it's Dee here. I'm just popping popping in to say, um, wow, that was that was such a fantastic array of tips and tricks and I have to say I've taken loads of notes myself I'm sure everybody on the call um has done the same um we've had quite a few questions uh we're probably not going to get to them because we're just very conscious of people um their lunch break I suppose and all the rest of it but I suppose just that we could maybe sort of round them up there's there's basically I'll just run through this four here that I could quickly just quick fire around and just see if we can cover some of them so the best age to start considering paying more attention to investing in pensions. So mm. as soon as you start working, um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's probably not what people want to hear. But the thing about pensions and any kind of investing, which essentially is what a lot of us are priority with investing is for our pension when we start off first. Um, it's more about the length of time than you have than what you put into it. So compounding is where the magic happens and compounding needs time. So even if it's very small, as soon as you start working, 
get it in there, get that habit started, start understanding pensions. Yeah. And then it's not the most exciting topic when you first start work, but it's really important. To yeah. The and great. And a great sort of behavior habit, as you say, to get into, which, yeah. is, which is what it's all about. So then there's two that are kind of similar. So tools and apps for tracking and budgeting spend. So, yeah. Yes. So this is always a hot, come, hot one. I saw in Ireland, actually, a lot of ads when I was home about, you know, the banks are now providing these, which is great when you bank with one bank. The issue is a lot of us have multiple banks, maybe less now in Ireland because so many of them have closed down, but we might have a credit <laughs> card with one and a, we might have Revolution and a Bank of Ireland, you know, and then how do we pull them together? Um, I personally use, and with my clients, I use Google Sheets. I use what I call my Google Sheets and I call them my clarity sheets. They're budgets, p ls you know, if we want to talk business language. But I do it on super simple. My advice would be super simple. We don't need all the bells and whistles. What you just want is where's my money going? Um, and if you're good with Excel or Google Sheets, you can use that. Um, otherwise, it's very hard to get an app that will link everything together, to be honest. I haven't found one yet. I'm so working you on to take it. Yeah, you take everything that you're your your ins and your outs and put them onto one sheet for yourself, I suppose. Yes. Most Brilliant. banks will give it to you in Excel. So you a lot of people don't know that. You can go in, you need to play around with the system sometimes and you can download load into CSL. It's much easier than to put into a Google Sheet. You're not typing in from a PDF. Brilliant. Um, and then one final question. As a trainee on a smaller salary um, and qualified accountants, are there any tips for saving money investments now to get started? So that investment piece which would be important yes. as well. So it is, again, I would say do that clarity piece. Really understand where you're spending your money right now. So then it'll help you make decisions so that you know how much you can, is a reasonable amount to pay for rent that you can dedicate to that and be really intentional with it. Because when, when we have smaller amounts, we need to be even more intentional to make sure that you are saving what you want to save so you can prioritize it. Um, and do that, like I said earlier, do the... Um, saving first but saving an amount that is reasonable for you and even if that's just five or ten euros that's absolutely fine it's getting the habit going because and you will find from a mindset once you see that growing it's amazing how we find ways to add more to it because sometimes yes. with a small amount what's the point it has every point just get started with it I totally agree with that because I know I wish I had started sooner when I was a student and I remember being like even if I had a you know set aside for fear or whatever it is a month it really does like build yeah. up and it's nice to have that wee cushion um yeah. for all your future plans or whether it's holidays or um yeah. whatever it is that's your goal and what you want to achieve for yourself so thank you and so giving much yourself that choices too isn't it so sometimes especially when we're young and opportunities come up with the freedom to do my friends are going on holiday and they've invited me oh do I have the money I have some savings so and we have the freedom from a lot from a lifestyle I mean I have three kids I can't go on holidays that short notice <laughs> but then I could have and then it becomes a financial thing so having your that choice and freedom for yourself is really important amazing Brilliant. I'm just popping into the chat there, um, your Instagram conscious uh, conscious finance coaching. So yeah. look, there's probably a million things coming up for people. So just connect with you there. I'm sure you're kind of, I know I've been following you. Great content goes out regularly there as well. So great way of Thank kind of engaging, you. starting to get this into on your radar and um, picking up some great habits um, as you've gone through today. Fantastic. Really, really great stuff, uh, Carol. Thank you so much. And obviously, Claire, thank you so much for being here and, and talking about the young professionals, which is just a great um, committee to get involved in. So look, thanks everybody for your time today. There is a recording. It will be sent out uh, as you've registered. And um, don't be strangers. Engage with the Institute as much as you can. There's lots of great stuff happening and great for networking now that we're all back into the in-person stuff. So um, enjoy your lunch breaks and we'll see you at the next one. Take care of yourselves. Thanks a million, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.